Hi, I'm Ms. History Guy, a co-writer for this channel and occasional presenter when topics present themselves that I'm interested in, and the destruction of the Great Library at Alexandria. I've long considered it one of the greatest tragedies in history. At its height, the Great Library held historians estimate almost half a million scrolls. It was a center of the intellectual and literary world. It was a center for the production of great works of art. It was a, a place where literary criticism was literally born. And then it was con. The modern concept of a cataclysmic fire destroying the Great Library in one night is probably incorrect. And the real history of what happened to the Great Library of Alexandria is perhaps more tragic, if not as dramatic, and is history that deserves to be remembered. In 331 BC, Alexander the Great founded Alexandria by Egypt around a small Egyptian town with the hopes of it becoming a center for Greek influence in Egypt. When Alexander died nine years later in Babylon, his enormous conquered empire immediately split into kingdoms ruled by his most important lieutenants. Of these successor kingdoms, one was Egypt, ruled by Alexander's general, Ptolemy I Soter, or Ptolemy the Savior. It was under the first Ptolemy that Alexandria became the capital of Hellenistic Egypt. The earliest mention of the library is an unreliable source that credits its founding to the first Ptolemy, who ostensibly decided to build the library when the exiled philosopher Demetrius of Phalerium, a great orator and student of Theophrastus, came to him with the idea. Theophrastus was a student of Aristotle, and thus the library was descended directly from Aristotle's famous Athenian school, the Lyceum. This story creates a neat narrative, but more thorough research has led most modern historians to believe that the library was not built until the time of Ptolemy's son, Ptolemy II, and that Demetrius played a lesser, if any, role. This makes the date for the creation and dedication of the library unclear. It was probably some time in the 3rd century BC. As early as 283 BC, there may have been as many as 30 to 50 scholars at the library. The library itself was only a part of a larger research institution called the Museon, or the Museaum, a temple to the muses, complete with an appointed priest. The institute even had a zoo, described as having animals which had never before been seen and were objects of amazement. The purpose of the institution was twofold. There was, of course, the goal of research, and for the library, the lofty goal of becoming a collection of all knowledge. It was said the agents had at their disposal a large budget in order to to collect, if possible, all the books in the world. More importantly, to the rulers of Egypt, who were foreigners in a recently conquered land, it was meant to shore up their authority in the kingdom and show off the massive wealth and beneficence of their rule. The Great Library was in the Royal Quarter, nestled in the center of the city and near the Great Harbor. A complete physical description of what the library looked like does not exist today, but most historians would believe that it wouldn't resemble anything like a modern library. Instead, it was kind of like a, a colonnade of rooms all lined up next to each other, and you wouldn't have even been able to find a book in this library, as the texts were all written on papyrus scrolls. The success of the museum and the library can be attributed to the Ptolemies, who began a vigorous policy of obtaining, copying, and patronizing writing, translation, and critical work. The first four Ptolemies, who ruled from 331 to 205 BC, were all intellectuals themselves and provided the library's most important resource, money. The museum was huge and extravagant, and the Ptolemies provided members with a salary, food, lodging, and tax exemption. This comprehensive benefit package drew the best minds of the Hellenastic world, including Euclid, Aristophanes, who calculated the circumference of the earth, and, according to some sources, Archimedes. To fill the library, the Ptolemies sent out royal purchasers armed with well-filled purses to purchase whatever books they could of every kind on every subject, and the older copy, the better. Older copies were prioritized because they had been copied fewer times and so were thought to have fewer errors. Ptolemy II even decreed that all books found on ships at Alexandria be brought to the library to be copied and translated into Greek, the only language the library kept books in. The ancient historian Galen says Ptolemy III asked Athens for the original copies of plays by Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides for copying, which the Athenians demanded 15 talents, around 1,000 pounds of precious metals as collateral. Ptolemy III had expensive copies made of the plays and then kept the originals and returned the copies, telling the Athenians that they could keep their talents. It wasn't even clear 
how many texts the library held. Ancient sources vary in their numbers from as few as 40,000 to as many as 700,000 scrolls in the Great Library of Alexandria. Modern historians consider many variables when estimating how many texts were held there, from how long it would have taken them to make copies to what was the length of the world's first catalog. It was by Callimachus, and it was called Pinakes, and it has been lost to history. The modern consensus seems to be that the Great Library had between 40 to 400,000 scrolls at its height. What is known as the collection was so large that it overflowed into daughter libraries, also temples to the muses, such as the nearby Serapeum. In the early years of the Museum, the head position of librarian, head librarian, was one of extreme honor, and the position was held by men of renown and learning, such as Apollonius of Rhodes, who wrote the Argonautica, the only surviving epic poem of the Hellenistic period. The most important accomplishment of the library was the standardization of translations like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which until then had existed in many different forms. The library was also instrumental in the creation of literary criticism. Under the head librarian Aristophanes, poem was first organized into stanzas instead of written out like prose, and textual marks were put over letters to indicate pronunciation. Scientists, doctors, and literary scholars gathered in Alexandria as the beacon of intellectualism in the ancient world but this golden age of study did not last. The decline and fall of the Library of Alexandria went hand in hand with the decline of the Ptolemaic regime. In the second century BC, two Ptolemaic brothers, Ptolemy Philometor and Ptolemy Phicon, fought over the throne. Widespread discontent led to interior instability and the whole of Upper Egypt revolted in 205 BC, remaining more or less independent for 20 years. The Seleucid Empire, centered in Antioch, invaded Egypt twice during this time, once in 169 and again a year later. The Ptolemy brothers split the kingdom, and when Philometor died, there was a scramble to put his son on the throne. But Sycon returned to marry his brother's widow and murder the boy to secure the kingdom for himself. Unfortunately for the library, the head librarian had supported Philometor's son, and in retaliation, Sycon expelled all foreign scholars from the city. The expulsion and instability caused an exodus of Alexandrian scholars to places all over the Near East and Mediterranean, leading one ancient historian to say that Alexandria had become teachers to the Greek and barbarian alike. The scholars brought their knowledge and intellectualism with them, founding schools or teaching in places like Rhodes, Rome, and the library at Pergamum. This unrest meant Egypt's focus turned away from scholarship, as later Ptolemies struggled to secure their rule. The position of head librarian rapidly lost prestige, and with some Ptolemies rewarding followers for the position whether they were scholars or not, Sycon even appointed one of his palace guards to it. It would be another hundred years before the library burned. In 48 BC, Julius Caesar, who was in the middle of fighting a civil war for control of Rome, was besieged in Alexandria by Egyptian elements of the Ptolemy dynasty. Caesar was heavily outnumbered, and to secure his position, Plutarch writes that he was forced to set fire to his own ships, which, after burning the docks, thence spread on and destroyed the Great Library. The accounts of the Great Fire differ. Some estimate that almost 40,000 scrolls were burned, while others claim that only a warehouse near the dock that had been storing scrolls burned. What is clear, though, is that the Museum survived the fire. The Greek geographer Strabo mentions visiting the museum decades after Caesar's fire. Plutarch mentions that Mark Antony donated 200,000 scrolls to Cleopatra for the library from Pergamum. Additionally, possibly the most prolific writer of antiquity, Didymus Acalcentris, was active in Alexandria at this time, purportedly authoring 3,500 to 4,000 works. More than 100 years after the fire, Roman Emperor Domitian was said to have restored several other destroyed libraries by seeking everywhere for copies of the lost works and sending scribes to Alexandria to transcribe and correct them. All of this implies that while the city declined, something of its glory days remained, limping further into history, even as its collection suffered from neglect. Alexandria's prominence continued to decline under Roman rule. The museum's membership rules became more lax, and the only known head librarian during the Roman period was a politician and military officer with no known scholarly achievements. The growing prominence of other libraries overshadowed Alexandria's, and several new libraries even opened in Alexandria itself, possibly stocking their shelves with scrolls from the older library. 
Mentions of the library and the museum seem to taper off around the middle of the 3rd century AD. Again, it isn't clear what this meant for the library itself or if the scrolls remained on the shelves or not. If they were still at the library in 272 when the entire quarter of the city the library was in was burned, when Emperor Aurelian captured the city from the Palmyrian Queen Zenobia, and if the library did still exist and survive that attack, it was almost certainly destroyed in the later siege by Emperor Diocletian in 297. Still, the daughter library of the Serapium still existed, though it isn't clear how long the temple held books. It probably held the largest collection of books in Alexandria during the 3rd century and became a center for pagans and Neoplatonist philosophers after the empire became Christian. In 391 AD, a fight broke out after Christians in Alexandria desecrated some cult objects, leading the pagans at the Serapium to take up arms and attack Christians. Eventually, the Christians trapped the pagans in the temple, and though the pagans were eventually allowed to leave, the Serapium was destroyed. It isn't clear that there were any books left at the temple, as all contemporary sources talk about its collection in the past tense, but if any books remained, they were either destroyed or looted from the site. Several later iterations of the museum seem to have existed, although it isn't clear where they were in the city or what collection of texts they may have had. Another source mentions a man of the museum named Theon, possibly the head of a school modeled after the original in the 5th century. His daughter, the pagan philosopher Hypatia, was head of the museum in 415, which is mentioned in extant letters and a powerful political personality in her own right. Her political relationships would eventually make an enemy of the Bishop of Alexandria, however, and several rumors aimed to harm her reputation led to a mob of Christians murdering and dismembering her in a church. If there was a museum at the time, and if it had any text copied or transported from earlier iterations, this attack would have once again threatened it, especially if they were considered pagan authors. There are even a handful of later sources that claim the library was only destroyed in or after 643, when the Muslim Caliph Omar is alleged to have said, If those books are in agreement with the Quran, we have no need of them, and if these are opposed to the Quran, destroy them. However, these sources were written long after the fact, and many modern scholars doubt their veracity. Many variables led to the downfall of the Great Library of Alexandria, and one of the most influential reasons it may have failed was that it lost its wealthy patrons. We don't know what texts the libraries held, or, or when it was lost, or, or we do know that there are texts that were existent in that library that we don't have anymore. Uh, one of the shining examples to me would be if we could find a copy of that lost catalog by Callimachus. But it could be that, that they were moved to a different library, and, and the fact of the matter is we just don't know. The survival of any text relies much less on the existence of one copy and more on the long chain of copyists transferring the text before the scrolls degraded. The papyrus scrolls were delicate things, easily destroyed by water or insects if not cared for, and centuries of neglect alone may have been enough to destroy the library's contents, or the text may have been transported and lost many years later. The library, though, had an enormous impact on history beyond the content of its text. Uh, before the Great Library of Alexandria existed, yes, there were indeed libraries, but after the Great Library of Alexandria ceased to exist, there were hundreds of libraries spread all across the Mediterranean led by scholars who could trace their systems and methodologies back to what they learned at the Great Library of Alexandria. It's had an effect on libraries to this day. There are approximately 350,000 libraries open across the world where people can come in and read preserved history and texts that have been kept in a methodology similar, perhaps, to what they used at the Library of Alexandria. I am a huge fan of public libraries. I have previously worked as a librarian, so I do know a little bit about preserving history for people who need to learn from it and so that we don't forget it. And I believe that libraries and those who walk their halls deserve to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>